I've got the pleasure of handing over now to uh, Jim Henry, who is a uh, Tax Justice Network Senior Advisor. And um, uh, Jim is going to, well, I'm, I'm actually going to hand over to Jim to, to say exactly what he is going to do and do his introductions. So uh, welcome, Jim. Hello, and over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a great conference and a great topic, and I'm delighted to be um, basically interviewing James Boyce, who I've known for 35 years. Um, Jim is a distinguished professor of economics uh, emeritus at uh, UMass Amherst. Um, he's also known for having done a lot of seminal work on the issue of capital flight. Uh, and that's how we first uh, met back in the 1980s when I was writing about uh, private banking and the Philippines. And he was in the Philippines working on uh, the Marcos regime um, and did a lot of uh, very important work uh, for the last uh, 30 years on that subject. Um, his most recent book, however, is on the interesting subject of carbon dividends, uh, carbon dividend uh, proposal. And he has a book, uh, 2019, um, called The Case for Carbon Dividends. Um, it's an interesting way to recharacterize what we're doing here uh, just from you know, part of the labeling problem with the issue of taxation here has been calling it a tax. Um, it immediately calls to mind uh, you know, wasteful government and what is gonna be done with the money. And um, Jim's point of view is basically that we have been undervaluing a common resource, which is the atmosphere that we all own. Um, and uh, have the right to uh, uh, get some return on that. And that one of the ways of recharacterizing this is a opportunity to uh, not only raise the price of carbon so that we reduce emissions, uh, but also to uh, win the political battle here is by making it clear that we're really going to have, most people are going to be better off if we have this new tax regime. In fact, uh, people at the bottom of the income distribution may actually get some uh, subsidies, uh, some of the subsidies that have been going to the fossil fuel industry that we've heard about this morning. Uh, so Jim, I guess uh, if he's online, I don't see him here right now, but I'd love to, uh, you know, to find him. Is I'm here. Oh, you are. There you are. Great. Greetings. <laughs> Oh, old bearded one. Are you in Massachusetts? I am indeed, yeah. Oh, okay. So let me not, um, you know, sort of take up any more time. Uh, I, I can refer everybody to the, the, the wonderful book that you've written about this subject, but let me start you off by talking about the history of your involvement uh, in, uh, in the climate change issue and also in the, the idea of the dividend tax. Where did that come from? Uh, and then we'll get into where it stands now and how does it compare to other things we can do about it? That sounds great. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for that uh, that very nice introduction, Jim. And it's it's nice to see you as always. Um, should we? Uh, when I got the program, it it asked me to make a ten minute kind of opener. Should I launch into that, or or should? Yeah, we just I would be. I'd be happy to have you do that. Um, okay. You, also, you know, I, I I guess one of the problems I'm having with our conference so far is we often you know, we are very technical. I mean, all everybody yeah. on, on the line here is kind of technical. Yeah. And, um, you know, for ordinary people, I mean, we're hoping to distribute this uh, broadcast to, to regular folks. So if we just simplify it as much as possible, um, and Got also it. maybe yep. get a little bit of the context of why we're out of time and, you know, how this would really address the crisis that we're, we're facing. Okay. Right Okay, so so let me start with just a little background since you asked how I got into this and, and then I'll just give a brief sketch of the, the carbon dividend uh, idea and uh, then then we'll have time for Q&A. So um, the, the way I got into this is that uh, some years ago, 20 years ago now, I was um, coordinating a project for the Ford Foundation about natural assets about ways to combine the goals of protecting the environment and building wealth in low-income communities and among low-income 
individuals by what we called building natural assets. And that had a variety of components, but one of them was about assets which are currently treated as open access resources. That is to say, they don't belong to anyone, uh, but they're valuable. Um, and one of the uh, papers that I commissioned for that uh, uh, purpose was from a man named Peter Barnes. Uh, and he co-authored it with an economist uh, in Boston named Mark Breslow. And it was about what we now call carbon dividends, although at the time the name for it was the Sky Trust. Peter was just coming out with a book called Who Owns the Sky, which was published in 2001. And that was where I first heard of this idea. And the idea was basically to uh, limit our use of the global carbon sink because of course it's scarce and the, the biosphere has a limited capacity to recycle emissions. Uh, and uh, by limiting it um, to in effect raise the cost of putting uh, carbon into the atmosphere, which means that there would be money, a price that consumers of carbon would pay in proportion to their carbon footprint and that that money could and should be captured and returned to the public on an equal per capita basis as what we now call dividends, based on the principle that you alluded to, Jim, which is that we all own in common and equal measure the gifts of nature, in this case, the limited carbon absorptive capacity of the biosphere. Um, <clears throat> I'd never heard of this idea before. I got very intrigued by it, and that led me into uh, really starting to look into the distributional impacts of carbon pricing. Peter's initial view was that we're going to have this kind of policy anyway, and it's just a matter of figuring out an equitable use for the money. Uh, but my view was, well, if we're going to get such a policy, we also need to look at the distributional incidence of the carbon price itself, whether that comes through a tax or through a cap and auction system. And um, when we do that, what we find, of course, is that a carbon tax or a carbon price has a regressive effect because people pay in proportion to their carbon footprints, the rich pay more than the poor, but as a percentage of their household income and expenditure, the poor generally pay more than the rich, at least in advanced industrialized countries, uh, because fossil fuels are a necessity and not a luxury. So the risk of having any policy that increases the price on carbon is that you're gonna hit consumers inevitably. That's, that's not a bug in the system. That's a feature of the system. And uh, that's gonna provoke resistance from people who are already hard pressed and who uh, don't appreciate it when the price of petrol or, or heating oil or electricity or whatever goes up. And so the, one of the political appeals of a carbon dividend policy is that by returning uh, the money, or at least a substantial chunk of the money, as I'll talk about, back to the public as equal per capita give dividends, you uh, not only protect the real incomes of the middle class, but you actually improve the real incomes net of uh, dividends and payments and higher fuel prices for low income households because they have the smallest carbon footprints because they don't consume as much of anything. That's what being poor is about. Um, and so um, in effect, through such a policy, you achieve a modest uh, improvement in income equity. You protect the policy from the political backlash that would otherwise ensue, I think, from a significant price on carbon. And you tackle the key issue of reducing carbon emissions. So let me, with that little background as to how I got into it, let me, um, explain a bit more. I think that in tackling climate policy, it's important to realize that there isn't one single policy that is the panacea and is the only one we need. I believe uh, that we need a mix of policies, including public investment, which I think should be uh, financed not by regressive taxes, but by progressive taxes. Um, I think we need regulatory standards. And I think very importantly, that along with whatever other policies are ruled out, we need to have a hard limit on the quantity of fossil carbon that we allow into our economies. By our economies, I mean the economies of each nation because the nation is the main 
policy-making unit we're dealing with in the world today. In some cases, it could be subnational units that implement policies as well, like states in the US. Um, and putting a hard limit on the amount of carbon coming in, that hard limit, I think, uh, can and should be indexed to or keyed to the trajectory that we need to meet the Paris Agreement's goal of holding the increase in global mean surface temperatures to one and a half to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And implementing that trajectory means something like cutting the amount of fossil carbon that we burn at a rate of 8% per annum between now and the middle of the century. Now that's a pretty ambitious reduction in our use of fossil fuels. It's a rate of reduction which has never been achieved by any of the climate policies implemented to date. So it's a significant rate. Now we might hope that by implementing better public investment policies, better regulatory standards by putting on a carbon tax or whatever, we could achieve that 8% per year reduction. And maybe we would, but it seems to me that an important thing to do is actually to impose that as a hard limit to say, look folks, this is all the fossil carbon that's gonna be allowed into the economy. And if our other policies are sufficient to reduce that at 8% per year over the next 30 years, that's great, but if they're not, we're gonna limit the amount of carbon coming in and we're gonna issue permits to bring it in up to that limit. Now those permits will have value. Those permits uh, in effect become the cause of the carbon price because by limiting the supply of fossil fuels, we raise their price just like OPEC did in the seventies. Um, if you cut supply, the price goes up. It's, it's economics 101. And so if that hard limit becomes binding, in other words, if the public investments and in regulatory standards, et cetera, on their own are insufficient to limit demand so that we're reducing uh, emissions at 8% per year, then the inevitable result of that is going to be higher prices for fossil fuels. Those are going to have a regressive effect, and they're likely to provoke a backlash from the public, in especially from working people who are already struggling to meet ends meet. As you will recall, during the Yellow Vest movement in France, one of the protesters said, you know, the government and Macron worry about the end of the world, we worry about the end of the month. And it's not only French workers who worry about the end of the month, a lot of people worry about the end of the month, and for good reason. So I think we need to face up to these realities. We need to face the reality that if we're going to prevent climate change beyond the levels in the Paris Agreement, we need a hard limit on fossil fuels to guarantee that we achieve that target. And if we have a hard limit, that's likely to become binding, likely to raise the price, likely to have adverse effects on income distribution and on the popularity of the policy. So what can we do about it? And it seems to me one of the most important things we can do about it is harvest the funds that come from those higher prices and recycle them to the people as equal per person dividends. So that's the basic story that, that, that I uh, have tried to tell uh, in my writings, in, including in my book. Um, I think what we need to do in, in every climate policy is try to combine efficacy, justice, and political sustainability. Those are the three things we need. We need to do that with our public investments. We need to do it with our regulatory standards, and we need to do it with the impacts of any policy that raises the price of fossil fuels, be that in the form of a, of a tax, a carbon tax, or in the form of a hard limit with auctioned permits, which is what I've just been talking about. Now, let me say a word about tax versus permits. These two are essentially equivalent, the difference being that a tax sets a price and allows the quantity of emissions to adjust, and a, and a cap or a limit sets the quantity and allows the price to adjust depending on the demand. Because our objective is to hit the limit to make sure that we achieve the targeted levels of reduction in emissions, it seems to me that having the limit is the best way to achieve this, and therefore auctioning permits 
when you've hit that limit is the most straightforward way to achieve a flexible carbon price consistent with those limits. However, many people prefer the idea of a tax partly because it's predictable. And I think it's fine to have both. You can have a tax that serves as a floor price for carbon permits. That's what the permits cost unless you've hit the limit. And if you've hit the limit, then you auction and the price goes up accordingly. That seems to me to be a perfectly reasonable and desirable hybrid policy. If you were to have a tax alone, with no cap and auction system, then it seems to me it would be extremely important from the standpoint of hitting the climate targets to index that tax to emissions reduction so that it automatically goes up as needed to achieve the reductions that we want to see. An indexing system like that was implemented by Switzerland in its CO2 levy on power plants. Auctioning permits is something that's been done quite a bit, including here where I live in New England and the northeastern states of the US, where every three months there's an auction for permits, again, to power plants under something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or, or Reggie. It's not rocket science to implement such a policy. From an administrative standpoint, the obvious place to implement it in terms of cost of implementation and also in terms of comprehensiveness is upstream where the fossil fuels enter the economy. So at the, the pipeline terminals, the coal mine heads, uh, etc. That's where you're measuring the amount of coal or uh, petrol, oil, or natural gas coming into the economy, you're calculating the amount of carbon in those fuels, and you're charging for either the tax or surrendering a permit for each ton of carbon you're bringing into the economy. That tax or, or price gets passed along to compute consumers in higher prices. That's an inevitable piece of it. Most assume that the pass through would be roughly 100%. And then you take the money that you received and you cycle it back to the public as equal per person dividends. And what's very important is that it be transmitted to the public, transferred in a way that's really visible, really transparent, and really widely understood to be fair, which means you don't bury it in the tax code which is a mistake that's been made in Canada, which has such a system now in four provinces, including the most populous, Ontario. They bury the dividend in the tax code. People can't see it in the tax code. I mean, I have a PhD in economics. I have to hire some guy to fill out my income tax returns. You know, if he says, oh yeah, your taxes this year, are, you know, $1,000 less because of your carbon dividend, who knows if it's true or not, right? People need to see the money. So it should come in a dedicated payment, the proverbial check in the mail, although in the modern world, that really means usually transfers into electronic transfers into accounts. Similarly, you can't bury it in electricity bills, which is what they're doing with the dividends uh, paid out of the auctions in California under its um, climate policy. I can't even understand my electricity bill either. It's even worse than the income tax system, you know? So people, you know, you need to make it really clear and visible how the money uh, is coming back. Um, it's very easy to sign up for these dividends. Alaska has a system that provides equal per person dividends from oil royalties. You can go online and look at the Alaska Permanent Fund. There's a one or two page PDF form that people fill out to show that they're a resident. Uh, in the US, probably what you would do is show you have a social security number and then boom, you start getting your dividends. It's not a difficult thing to do uh, logistically. Now, one final point I'll mention and then I'm happy to open up to Q&A. Um, it's not necessarily the case that you need to return 100% of the carbon revenue as dividends in order to achieve the objectives of justice and political sustainability. Um, you could return 75% of the money as dividends, and that would leave you 25% of the revenue that could be used for other purposes, like uh, public investment, transitional adjustment assistance, or just transition policies for workers in communities displaced in the clean energy transition, international assistance, adaptation. You could do a lot with the rest of the money. Um, and one of the reasons why it's possible to do that and still have 
um, the effect of keeping working families whole is that roughly in the US at least, and it varies a bit from country to country, 25% of total carbon emissions come from government expenditure on fossil fuels at the local, state, and federal levels. So if you're recycling the money that consumers pay back to consumers on this uh, egalitarian basis, reserving about 25% of the money to recycle back to governments, perhaps with some um, strictures as to how the money should be used by governments, um, is to me a reasonable idea. So in the proposals that have been uh, floated in Washington, there have been bills uh, over the years, over the last decade, that have sought to introduce such a policy. Some ask for 100% dividends to the consumers, others 75% with 25% allocated for public investment. Either of those is okay with me. If we had a serious carbon policy achieving an 8% per year reduction in emissions, we'd be generating a lot of money. How much much. We don't know because we don't know what all the other policies in the mix would be. We don't know how quickly the costs of solar and wind will continue to fall, etc. But it's not at all inconceivable that, the, that you could very quickly get carbon prices in the range of hundreds of tons, uh, hundreds of dollars per ton of carbon. Roughly speaking, a, a hundred dollar price of carbon would add a dollar uh, to the price of a gallon of gasoline in the United States. That gives you a kind of ballpark figure. And at that price, you'd be generating um, several thousand dollars a year in equal per person dividends for consumers, uh, for households in the United States. And you would have billions of dollars left over if you earmark 25% for public investment. So again, to me, the purpose of carbon pricing, it's not an end in itself. It's, a, it's an artifact, an effect of having a serious policy that limits the amount of fossil fuels we allow into our economy. It's an effect that we need to anticipate and deal with. Um, the price itself sends incentives to you know, consumers, businesses, governments to reduce their use of carbon. That's all fine. But the main reason we need this is because we're not really serious about climate policy unless we have that commitment to a trajectory, including hard limits. And um, it should go hand in hand with other policies. It's not the, the only policy we need, but to my mind, it's a necessary uh, part of the mix. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. Let me just lead off with uh, one basic question, which is where does this stand in Washington? How uh, is there, are there bills that have been produced? How, is the Biden yeah, transition yeah. team on board with uh, such a ah. plan? I wish, I wish the Biden team were on board. I, I think it's conceivable that they'll get on board, um, but I'm not sure. So in, in Washington right now, um, there are um, several bills that have already been um, introduced in the last legislative session or earlier that include carbon dividends. They vary in their particulars. Um, one bill introduced by uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen, uh, who began introducing this bill a decade ago when he was in the House of Representatives, he's a Democratic senator from Maryland, would um, recycle 100% of the money back to the public as dividends. And in fact, in the past versions of the bill, whether his new one will do this or not, I'm not sure. I've tried to talk them out of this. The dividends are non-taxable. Um, I think that's a problem because that means that you're basically not keeping the government whole. There's no way for the government to recoup the higher prices it's paying in fossil fuels. But they didn't want to be seen as the government gives money with one hand and takes it away with the other, even though I say it's not giving people the money, it's their money because they yeah. own the air, right? Um, so that's one bill. Um, that will certainly be uh, reintroduced again in the coming legislative session. Another bill is uh, that I believe is going to be reintroduced is from Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington State, also a Democrat, who introduced a bill jointly, a bipartisan bill in the past with Susan Collins of Maine, a Republican, which called for 75% of the money to go back in dividends and 25% to be used for uh, public investment. So There's several... Has, this sorry. Bipartisan appeal. 
It does, uh, but at least it did. They're, they're now looking for bipartisan sponsorship during the Trump regime. That was very difficult to find. Whether it will become easier uh, now that that's changing is an open question. I would hope so, because my own view is that even though bipartisanship is something that is poo-pooed on both sides in the US these days, um, a really important feature of, of any such policy is that it be politically durable in the face of likely changes in the balance of power over the 30 years needed to achieve the clean energy transition. So we want a policy that's going to have the staying power of Medicare in the US, this, which is our public health care for people over 65 like myself, um, uh, the staying power of Social Security, universal coverage, uh, a, a policy that's very popular and achieves bipartisan support. So even when neoliberal zealots come to power, they can't dismantle these things. They're just too damn popular to do. And, and, and I think um, that's a bipartisan basis for such a policy is a, is a key part of its political uh, durability. So there are these proposals out there. Last thing I'll say, um, on the liberal left, in the United States, the whole notion of having any price on carbon got a bad name, uh, partly because of the terrible uh, cap and trade uh, debacles of a decade ago, when the Democrats proposed a cap that would have raised prices, but it wasn't a dividend policy. It was give away the permits, let the firms make windfall profits as a way to buy in their support for the policy. And the Dems poo-pooed the fact that this was going to hit working people. And the Republicans, you know, pontificated about how this was going to be a huge tax on working Americans. And guess what? The Republicans were right. It would have been. And it provoked a tremendous backlash. And people don't even want to talk about uh, prices anymore, be it taxes or caps. And moreover, on the left, there's this visceral and rather, I have to say, unthinking notion that anything involving prices is somehow a neoliberal market-based idea, um, whereas to my mind, zero is a price as well. And it's not a very good price to have for carbon emissions. You know, I tell exactly. people, are you against parking meters? You know, well, that's a price for parking your car in the street. We're talking about car parking carbon in the atmosphere. We don't want it to be free because it belongs to the public. And if you don't have a price on it, you're going to overuse and abuse the resource. So anyway, yeah. So I'm hoping that that in the Biden administration, we'll see this coming forward. Um, there are also some state level initiatives, which is also good. Um, uh, but it, it all remains to be seen. I don't think it'll just happen. I think it will require some real active advocacy. And carbon dividends have not been a policy that's benefited from a lot of investment in advocacy um, and dissemination in the past, mainly, I think, because nobody gets rich from carbon dividends, right? If there's no vested interests who want to fund this idea. Well, I wanted to ask you about the international reach of the idea, whether any other countries have yeah. thought about uh, similar things uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. Also, Great there's question. also the idea of a state. I mean, I'm having this conversation this afternoon with uh, the New York Senate, where they are scrounging okay. for revenues. Um, and they're looking at a, a state level financial transactions tax as one measure. Yeah. Um, yep. But uh, in Sag Harbor, New York, we have free parking for very rich uh, people who own landovers. <laughs> and I've been fighting that battle for a long time. It's a similar kind of problem at yeah. the local yeah. level. Yeah. So yeah. what about the idea of the international uh, scope of this? And also, could states start a, a sure. adopting yeah. some of this? Well, um, um, let me start with international. This is a policy that would have similar effects to those I've described in every country in the world. It, it would work anywhere. In fact, the very first piece I wrote about this back in 2007 was called a Chinese Sky Trust. It came in a, out in a journal called Energy Policy, and it was about the impact of such a policy in China. And what I had suspected was that in low-income countries, and we use 1995 data from China, so it was still relatively low income back then, um, fossil fuels are not, uh, taxing fossil fuels is not uh, regressive or not as regressive because really poor people don't consume fossil fuels. They can't afford it. I lived in, you know, villages 
villages in India and Bangladesh, people didn't use fossil fuels. So I figure it's, you know, there the progressive impact of such a policy would be even stronger because the price itself would have a progressive impact and then the dividends would uh, reinforce that. That said, raising fuel prices, even in low income countries is a politically sensitive thing to do. And I think you need the dividends to protect the policy from um, public uh, outcry. Um, but um, in each country, uh, such a policy would work. And I think um, the demonstration effect will be that in whichever countries adopt it first, it's likely to spread. Other countries will look, it'll be popular. Other countries will look at it and it will spread. At least that's my hope. Um, in terms of where there's interest in this policy, um, the French edition of my book, which has a different title, it's called in French, the the Little Manual of Climate Justice for Citizens, which is a much catchier title than the case for carbon dividends. Uh, that book is, has been selling really well. And I think there's a lot of interest in this idea in France, uh, partly because the Yellow Vest movement kind of taught a lesson to the enviros and made them realize that, hey, if we're gonna have a, uh, anything that's raising the price of fossil fuels, we need to do this in a way that's, that's just and politically sustainable. Uh, and that's essentially what my book uh, tries to lay out is how one could do so. So I think there's, it's got legs in France. I was supposed to do, go there and do some talks uh, when the book came out earlier uh, this year, but then COVID got in the way, so I couldn't go. Um, but I, I hope that it, that it'll pick the idea will pick up some steam not only in France but but elsewhere uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, that remains to be seen. The only nation that has adopted such a policy so far as Canada, um, Trudeau uh, brought in a carbon dividend a couple of years ago for the states that didn't or the provinces that already didn't have a carbon price in place, which includes Ontario. Um, and uh, there, unfortunately, I think they did two things wrong. First, they set the carbon price very low. So it's not having a major impact on, um, on uh, consumption. And B, they buried the dividend as an income tax adjustment. Um, which I already alluded to why I think that's a very poor idea from the standpoint of building support for the policy. So I wouldn't hold up the Canadian example as a model. That said, it shows that national governments have kind of, you know, are starting to get this idea, even if they haven't quite wrapped their hands around how to do it in the, in the best way. Well, there was a specific question from Toby Sanger about the Canadian carbon tax and yes. refund system. Um, and he also uh, suggests that maybe uh, consumption isn't that responsive to fossil fuel prices for several reasons. And that carbon pricing has to be really uh, just part of this package. I think you agree with that, but you know, maybe you could speak to the, the evidence we have on how responsive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I agree it ought to be part of a package, as I've already said. And how uh, high prices and, would have In terms of, of price responsiveness, this, of course, depends on what else is in the mix. If you've got a lot of public investment and mass transit in the mix, it's easier for people to respond to higher uh, motor fuel prices by, by taking uh, public transit. Um, if you've got charging stations for electric vehicles in the mix, it's easier for people to respond, et cetera. Uh, that said, we do have some evidence on price responsiveness. And you're absolutely right. Um, fossil fuels are what economists call a a price inelastic good, that is to say, a relatively large price increase is needed to achieve a relatively small decrease in the quantity uh, consumed. The evidence we have is that um, from looking at, these are from studies of things like response, consumer responses to oil price increases under the OPEC increases and so on, is that um, in the short run, a 10% increase in the price leads to about a 3% reduction in demand. And in the long run, it leads to about a 6% reduction in demand. So what that implies is if you're going to achieve an 8% reduction, if price was the only thing you were using to achieve this, um, you would need to be, to cut demand by 8% per year, you would need to be increasing fossil fuel prices at a rate of something like 15% per year. And in order to do that, 
that's increasing the, the price at the pump of, of petrol, right? Or, or, or the per kilowatt hour of electricity. So the initial price you need to achieve that can be easily calculated from that. And then you can ratchet it up to achieve a further 10 or 15%, whatever it is per annum increase in the uh, price of fossil fuels. And I do some of these calculations in, in an illustrative table in my book, so you can see the amounts of money generated. Now, the truth is no one really knows what over the long term the price responsiveness will be, partly because no one really knows what else is gonna be in the policy mix, and no one knows what the future costs of alternative renewable, clean renewable fuels are gonna be, solar, wind, et cetera. Those prices have fallen much faster than people thought they would five or 10 years ago, and I hope they'll continue to do so. And were that to happen, the price increases you would need to achieve the, the clean energy transition on the trajectory we need uh, would be lower than if that progress stalls out. So that's part of why I, I argue that we need to set the limit and key the price to that limit, index the price to that limit, either via auction permits or through automatic adjustments in the tax right, rather than just set a price and hope for the best. Canada is an example of setting a price and hoping for the best. And as politicians are prone to do, they set the price very low because they're nervous and they want to be optimistic and they don't want to upset people. Say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll set a price of you know $10 per ton of carbon. Well, $10 per ton of, ton of carbon adds 10 cents to the price of a gallon of gasoline in the United States. Today, gasoline in the United States costs in real terms half of, uh, half of what it cost in 2008. So adding 10 cents, a, you know, it's like $2 less. So adding 10 cents a gallon isn't going to solve the climate problem. I'm sorry, it's just a fantasy. You need to have a serious price and you need to face the serious economic and political consequences that come with that. Let me ask you about what we could do at the state level with my friend, uh, Senator James Sanders. I'll talk to him this afternoon. So is yeah. there any U US state that has taken action or is that something a, a state like yeah. New York could get into? Yeah. States, there's a lot of discussion at the state level. Most states, and I think you'll find this is the case in New York as well, have viewed carbon taxes or carbon prices, you know, some California's used an auction system. So, the, so they, they have the flexible price with the ceiling on the number of permits. Um, they've viewed it mainly as a way to raise revenue for the state because states are strapped for revenue, as you mentioned, right? Um, and, you know, I'm not against states raising revenue, but I prefer that revenue be raised via progressive taxes, not via regressive taxes. And yeah. carbon is a regressive tax. So my view is that tempting though it is for enviros and others to say, oh yeah, we can raise revenues via carbon tax. Um, if, you, if you're gonna have a carbon price that is um, adequate to doing the job of propelling the emissions reductions we need, then um, you have to recycle a substantial share of that money back to the public as dividends. No way around it. And every dollar you recycle as dividends is a dollar less than the, than the government gets to use for whatever purposes it wants, right? It either goes in dividends or it goes to the government. Those are the two choices. Well, there's a third choice. If you give away permits like in cap and trade, then the money goes to the fossil fuel companies that get the free permits and they get windfall profits. I'm assuming that around this table, there aren't many people who would advocate that. But there are lots of people, and including on the liberal left, who advocate public uh, it going back to the government instead of going back to the people. Um, and I think that's politically short-sighted. Uh, I think there's room for some of it going to the government, but you really need a lot to go to the people. Now, that said, the kinds of carbon prices that are usually discussed by states and that you'll find them discussing even in New York, which is moving ra relatively aggressively compared to many other states, are quite low. You know, $25 a ton is what you're probably like to, likely to hear when you talk to your your. Uh, your New York legislator friends. Right. And so $25 a ton is again, a very modest price. It's gonna add a quarter to the price of gasoline. 
all right, well, that's something. It does generate a lot of revenue. It may be small enough that it won't even provoke a political backlash. That's fine. But if what we really need is to add a dollar a gallon next year and another dollar the following year and another dollar the year after that, you've got to make sure you're getting that money back to the people. And if the state keeps its 25 cents or 50 cents off, the, off of it, that's fine. They, they can get away with that, I suspect. Yeah. So I think at the state level, um, because of the focus on using this as an instrument to raise revenue for government expenditures for various kinds of good works, the enviros, of course, prefer them to be used for um, environmental expenditures, including on the clean energy transition. Some prefer them to be used for education and health care. Um, some liberals prefer them to be used to, to provide um, subsidies to low-income households. They prefer means testing. They don't like the idea of dividends because that means Jeff Bezos gets a dividend. God forbid you should be giving a couple thousand dollars a year to Jeff Bezos, you know? Um, and, you know, my view is that you want the dividends to be universal. That means even Jeff Bezos gets a dividend. This is like the social security model. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You don't want the administrative burden of means testing, and you don't want the political fallout that comes with means testing, where some people feel that uh, they're being discriminated against because they're not getting the benefits and the benefits are going to the undeserving poor. The liberal think of the poor as the deserving poor, but there are these other folks in our country who have the opposite view, right? So um, even, uh, I'll, I'll, last thing I'll say about this on this universalism, because it is such a sticking point for so many left liberals. Um, but you may remember in the presidential primaries, um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders both advocated free college for all, you know, for public schools, public universities, right, for everyone, universal. And Pete Buttigieg, uh, who was running, uh, criticized them, saying, why should there be free college for the kids of millionaires? They can afford to send college, right? And one of the people who tweeted out a response to him was AOC. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right. yeah. our, yeah. our wonderful uh, left um, representative from New York mm -hmm. and uh, the, lead, the leader of the so-called squad, right? And she said, universal means for everybody. We don't tell rich people they can't use public libraries. We don't deny them mm -hmm. fire protection. Universal means it's for everyone. And doing it means that we all um, are in the same boat sharing something together. It helps to bring us together. And that I think it, it applies to carbon dividends as well. Same argument. So some of us think the rich should be required to go to public libraries. That would be a, a useful thing to- Don't get me started on what we should require. Them. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about the politics of this because uh, we had uh, interesting uh, discussion uh, about six months ago with Ralph Nader about why, you know, after 61 years of talking about climate and, uh, and having the world's leading scientists and, you know, everybody kind of getting together the latest time in Paris, uh, coming up with accords about this stuff and endless studies and technical expertise thrown at the problem, lots of proposals. Um, we basically have not been able to sell uh, people on a, on, a, on a solution so far. So part of it is obviously the fossil fuels industry and all that and their you know, subsidies yeah. that they get as well. Um, but Nader's point was that we basically on the left have been very poor at doing what the right has made uh, kind of uh, one of its strong points, which is actually working the halls of Congress, uh, working night and day, lobbying, explaining things to the American people, framing this, these proposals in a way that, you know, doesn't start with all the, you know, the number of units of PPM in the atmosphere, um, you know, yeah. or, or the yeah. degrees, but how do we actually get, you know, I mean, part of the problem, I think, you know, we're both economists. Um, economists are sort of the last people you like to go to in order to make politics because they're, they have a hard time, you know, just, Talking, talking uh, you know, getting in, in people's, you know, and making themselves understood. I think that's a, a big issue. How do we do that? Yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. And I think uh, Nader's right about that. Um, well, um, I think the framing issue is a really important one. 
And I would say that the environmental movement has done a singularly poor job of framing the issue because they framed the issue as one in which we need to make sacrifices today in order to protect the planet for the sake of future generations. Now, most people like the idea of protecting the planet for future generations, but they don't particularly like the idea of making sacrifices, especially if they feel they're going to be making disproportionate sacrifices while other people are, you know, making hay while the sun shines. And if they're not 100% convinced that the sacrifices are worthwhile. So that framing of climate policy, what I sometimes in the book, I call it the eat your broccoli approach, because some people don't like broccoli. I love broccoli. But anyway, eat your broccoli is the phrase, right? Um, you know, you need to eat it because it's good for you, even though you don't like it, right? That approach, I don't think sells very well. It works great among guilty white liberals, right? Who feel, um, you know, uh, a sense of sin and atonement and all of that. It doesn't work that well on the among the broader American public. And I don't think this is just America. I think it's true. You know, the Yellow Vest movement showed it's true in France. I think it's true pretty much everywhere, right? So to me, a really important part of the framing is to frame this not simply as a policy that brings long run benefits to humankind worldwide, which is what it is, but also as a policy that can bring, if designed properly, short run benefits to people within the political jurisdictions implementing the policies between within the nation or the province or the state, right? So you're not just talking about the future with the whole problem of discounting the well being of the future and uncertainty. And you're not talking about the whole world where there's spillover benefits to everyone else. And why should we cut our emissions if China isn't, et cetera? You remember Bush said that in withdrawing from Kyoto, right? Um, so, how can we do that? And it seems to me there are basically three prongs of a strategy for um, uh, framing climate policy as a way to benefit people here, meaning in the place adopting the policy, and now meaning in the present generation, like starting next year, starting immediately, right? Uh, so that it's a win winner policy for people to have this now, regardless of what it does for saving the planet for future generations. It's a winner policy in and of itself. It's not a sacrifice, it's a benefit. One of the ways, is to have dividends. For the majority of people, that means they've got more money in their pocket at the end of the day as a result of this policy. Why? Because you're charging the rich for their carbon emissions and you're recycling the money on an egalitarian basis. So that's that dividends is one key part. But there are two other key parts that, that one of which I've done a lot of work on and one of which others, including uh, some of my colleagues here at, 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 at the Political Economy Research Institute have worked on. The one I've worked on is on air pollution co-benefits. So when we burn fossil fuels, we're not only emitting CO2, we're emitting a slew of other nasty pollutants, sulfur dioxide, carbon, um, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, etc. Mm -hmm. These kill millions of people every year around the world. Air pollution from burning fossil fuels is one of the major causes of premature death worldwide. By cutting those emissions, we improve people's health here and now in the places where we're cutting the emissions. Really so important. This, this is a particular important selling point in um, countries with really high levels of air pollution, like China and India. But it's even an important point in the US and Europe, because even in the US and Europe, this is true. You can, you, you can if you use just the most conventional and to my mind somewhat dubious methods of valuation of uh, the impacts of climate change and the impacts of air pollution, the impacts of air pollution alone not counting carbon emissions, just this other stuff, are enough to justify carbon prices that are higher than any of the prices we currently see in Europe, apart from perhaps that in Sweden. So that's- Jim, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the sky hook from our sponsors here. Oh, we'll, okay. We'll, we'll All right. Well, let me just quickly just mention the last- Two more sentences. <laughs> yeah. The last, the last here and now benefit is job creation. You know, yeah. the clean energy transition can create a lot of good jobs here and now. 
And so right. those are the three things that seem to me to be key in reframing this, not as a sacrifice we have to bear that the, that the environmentalists are telling us we have to endure, but rather as an opportunity that we can and should seize. Excellent. And thank you so much. And maybe we can actually get somebody to support this policy. I think it's a great idea. And well, Jim, I, I recommend yeah. your book to everyone. And uh, let's continue to talk to uh, uh, the people about how to well, get this. Policy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm obviously, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. And anytime you find any way for me to try to disseminate it, just let me know. I'm, I'm ready. Thanks very much, Jim. Great. Okay, thanks, folks. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. tuning in. Yep. Well, uh, thanks, James and Jim. Lovely to see you, Jim. Long time. Nice to see you, John. How are you? Yeah. I'm very, very well indeed, and I can see you're looking great as well. And and thanks also to uh, to Jim Henry from Sag Harbor. That was a great discussion. I could actually have listened to you for the rest of the evening over here, but um, now I'm going to wrap up. Um, so thanks, James and Jim, and thanks to all of today's speakers. Uh, I think we've covered a huge amount of ground today, but, uh, but if there's one message I hope that we can all take away from this discussion today is that the economics that have shaped the world in, in 2020 are totally unfit for purpose. Um, if we dig deep enough, uh, we can see that uh, bad economics are behind so many of the crises that we currently suffer, including inequality, debt crisis, uh, social breakdown, climate emergency and so on. And yet we can find messages of hope for progressives to draw on. In his um, discussion with Nick, um, Nick Shackson early on, Peter Boppinger outlined how government-led investment can accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels, creating new jobs, improving welfare and well-being for current and for future generations. Laura identified what must be the biggest mince pie in history, a 5.2 trillion mince pie of fossil fuel subsidies and uh, economic externalities, which could be withdrawn from the energy markets and targeted at, uh, amongst other things, social safety net nets for the most badly impacted communities. Uh, and Jacqueline, in her talk, she pushed back against some of the myths that have been constructed around carbon taxes. So on the one hand, she noted that the status quo was deeply regressive, impacting most on poorer communities, including some of the communities referred to by, by Suzanne in her opening remarks, when she pointed out that so much oil and gas production has displaced some of the world's poorest communities from their indigenous lands. On the other hand, Jacqueline noted that properly designed carbon taxes, for example, on aviation fuels, can be wholly progressive in their social and ecological impacts. And in this final session, Jim Boyce and Jim Henry discussed how a carbon dividend payment to households could be built into a carbon pricing regime in ways that protect and improve the well-being of lower income households, which are generally low carbon tax, low, low carbon users. So overall, the, the mix of policy measures that we've discussed today, removing fuel, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, plus government-led investment in transiting away from fossil fuels and improving energy use efficiency, plus designing carbon taxes and dividend payments in ways that can improve the well-being of lower income households. This mix provides an economic platform that can both accelerate the end of the fossil fuel era while also making a start at tackling the inequalities that are wrecking social stability across the world. So I hope that we can draw some hope from today's sessions. Turning to tomorrow's session, which will be largely focused on the politics of financing the transition away from fossil fuels. We open at 1400 GMT with a keynote speech from Sven Gigold member of the European Parliament and incidentally a former chair of the Tax Justice Network Steering Committee, followed by a panel discussion involving Chinyi Liu from the European and American Studies uh, Institute in Taiwan and Daniela Gabor from the University of West England. That will be moderated by Aaron uh, Pastani from Novara Media. And after that panel discussion, we have Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, 
and incidentally also a former chair of Tax Justice Network. And she will be discussing with me and TaxCast producer Naomi Fowler about her vision of what could be achieved in the coming decade if society, civil society can build sufficient pressure for the kind of pro progressive changes we've been discussing today. And in the final wrap up session, uh, a panel discussion, we have Molly Scott Cato, former MEP, member of the European Parliament, Sven Gigold, Harpreet's Karl Poor, and uh, Leon Seely Huggins, and they'll be discussing when next for money, climate and political will. And that session will be moderated by Alex Cobham, Chief Executive of the Tax Justice Network. So thank you again for joining us for day one of this Tax Justice Network conference. Thanks to uh, again to our speakers and moderators, and thanks to the super competent team who've been behind the scenes organizing the technology. Hope to see you again tomorrow, starting at 1400 GMT.